Hello, everyone. Uh, so, so we have a shift in gears to a different type of uh, um, geophysics uh, application. And so the title of my talk is, What is the Rate Limiting Step in Furthering uh, Our Understanding of Subduction Dynamics? So let me start out with, first, um, uh, what, are, what is the rate limiting um, step when you have a series of subprocesses? So for example, we're familiar with you have a viscoelastic deformation of the Maxwell solid, you're rate limited by the slow response of your viscous dash plot and your mechanical uh, deformation. If you have diffusion of vacancies through um, a grain, you're going to be rate limited by the slowing diffusion species or diffusion of silicon or oxygen as a sort of silicate mineral. And if I try to leave for work in the morning, I'm rate limited by cooperation of my son. <laughs> so what we want to uh, look at is sort of break down subduction modeling process and ask what might be the rate limiting um, steps that are preventing us from making new discoveries um, and understanding the system of uh, subduction. So first I want to start out with looking at what are the subprocesses of subduction. So first, in any study that I do, I start out with compiling observations. And there's two different sets of observations that I need to compile. First you want to define the initial state of the model. Um, what sort of geometry am I going to be using? What is the thermal structure? Uh, which ultimately affects the density and, and the viscosity structure, uh, what are the age of the plates, um, and then also finding um, uh, material properties from the experimental uh, results. And then the second set of data that you require is actually how you're going to test and analyze the model results. Um, this is a uh, range of different sorts of data, uh, kinematic um, observations of plate trench motion, um, observations of mantle flow, like seismic anisotropy, stress state of either the slab or the overriding plate, um, topography, gravity, magnetism, sedimentary record, seismicity, basically any observation that we have from geology or geophysics because of some indication of how either the surface of the earth, the mantle, or the slab itself um, has responded um, to the process of subduction. The next step is actually designing the numerical model itself. Um, this starts out with this, such a basic question of which equations am I going to use, which approximations of those equations, what is the size of the model domain, uh, what sort of mesh am I going to use, what are the boundary conditions or initial conditions um, for the model setup, am I going to do instantaneous calculations, or focus on a, a region today and asking what is the flow and stress state of that uh, region at this point in time, or am I interested in time evolution um, of uh, either a system or maybe more generic process of subduction. And um, always as a part of this process, we have to think about what are the necessary simplifications that are imposed either by the numerical method that we're using, our access to resources um, in the time, um, our patients basically, how long are we willing to actually wait for a model result to come out. The next step is actually running a series of experiments, numerical experiments. Um, at this point, you always have to decide what is it that I'm actually trying to learn from the system? Which parameters will be held uh, fixed or varied? Um, this is going to depend on what um, range of uncertainty you have in the certain parameters. If you're interested in the viscosity structure or maybe the effect of a phase transition on um, subduction dynamics, uh, what is the range of uncertainty either from observation or other sort of experimental constraints? And then you have to know what obser uh, which obs observables are going to be sensitive to these parameters that you're varying. No help um, to be varying a set of parameters and have an observation that is not uh, actually varying at all as you vary that parameter because you're not sensitive to the system. The, the next step is to, um, to analyze the modeling results. And I break this down into sort of two steps of analysis. Um, first, there's just looking at the general like, fluid dynamics and mechanical behavior of the system that you just modeled. Um, you know, what happens in these numerical models? Right. Um, the second step is the actual comparison to observations. And this is where you are trying to figure out, well, is the experiment that I've done actually applicable to the Earth? It doesn't allow me to learn something about the parameters of the processes that are going on in the subduction system that on, on Earth. And then hopefully this will lead to a new understanding of um, subduction dynamics. Um, but in this whole process, you have to ask, what is, what is limiting um, our um, our uh, progress in discovering um, how systems are working. We've been working on subduction dynamics for uh, 25, 30 years, and we keep making progress, but if there's some uh, step in 
this overall process that if we could improve quite a bit, that we would be able to make progress much faster. Okay. I'm not going to answer that yet, but instead I'm going to um, go through some what I think are some outstanding questions in seduction dynamics, give you some examples from my own work um, of um, integrating observations and numerical models and visualization, and then come back to sort of breaking down the seduction modeling in terms of the cyber infrastructure that's needed, and then revisit this question of what is the rate limiting process. So um, a couple, a few questions that I think are the important scientific drivers for looking at subduction modeling. Uh, so first, a broad question is, um, how does labs drive plate motion at the surface of the Earth? And um, when you uh, look at a subduction system, you can break it down into what are the driving forces, the density variations that are actually um, allowing to, uh, to pull the plate into the mantle. How are those forces actually transmitted to the plate, the uh, deformation weakening of the plate? Only some fraction of that force will be directly um, transferred from the surface uh, to the plate itself. Other uh, forces will be transmitted through basal shear. Um, what are the resisting forces, resisting sinking of the slab, the viscous stresses, and changes uh, to just phase transitions that actually create sort of uh, uh, positive buoyancies that prevent subduction? And then what are the dynamic feedbacks that actually regulate plate speeds? Okay, there has to be some balance between these driving and resisting forces um, that you know, give us a sort of uh, range of plate velocities that we observe on the surface of the Earth. There you go. Um, a second question would be, what are the main controls on non-steady state evolution of slabs? Um, here I'm just showing a um, simple 2D model of uh, the evolution of a, a slab being driven by kinematic boundary conditions. And what you can see here is a very simple model in which I have phase transitions and I'm using uh, the form of the equations that include shear and heating. Um, and you have a pretty complex evolution of that slab. Uh, in the mantle. So some of the things that might affect the non-steady state evolution of slabs are the effects of large-scale rheological structures, both layered and the um, structure of the slab, um, the effects of phase transitions and related processes such as grain size reduction, latent heat, and localized torques on the slab related to actually the compositional layering of the slab itself and where those phase transitions occur, and then how the slab motion is reflected in, in um, plate boundary motion and uh, structure and deformation of the overriding. <coughs> so there's all, in this model I have a, this is a fixed trench, there's no feedback basically between what's happening to the slab and the surface deformation, but we're now uh, developing models in which that trench is free to respond and move um, as, the, as the slab is deforming within the mantle. <coughs> And then a uh, third question is instead of looking at the plates of the slab itself, but then asking how do slabs actually drive flow in the surrounding mantle? And this is a question driven in large part by observations from seismology, um, shear wave splitting and seismic anisotropy, which shows that we have flow around slabs that is not always what we would assume from our sort of first order model of quarter flow of a subducting plate. Um, so what determines the ratio of toroidal to poilodal motion in subduction zones? Um, and what are the conditions necessary to generate significant um, uh, trench parallel flow in the subduction zone? So those are uh, the questions that we're interested in. So I'll go through um, just three examples from my own work um, in which we've developed models using observations and then use different sets of observations to, um, to test those models. So first um, example is a model of the Alaska subduction zone. This is work by the former graduate student Margaret Jadamek. And what we were, uh, we, she developed a very detailed model of the um, a 3D model of the Alaska subduction zone, and we focused in on the eastern edge of that subduction zone where you actually have the edge of the slab, uh, which is shown here. And what we were interested in is how the flow of the slab edge depends on the rheological structure of the mantle. Um, and so we had to use a large uh, range of observations to build the model to actually give us a slab shape that we thought would be very similar to what was actually in the mantle, which is harder um, to know. Uh, for example, in this eastern region, there's an abrupt cutoff in seismicity, um, but there was not a good tomographic model to tell us whether that uh, uh, cutoff in seismicity was actually the edge of the slab or just the edge of the seismically active part of the slab. Um, so we had to make, uh, we actually made different models with different assumptions 
to test what the effect of having a sharp slap edge versus a more um, a more continuous slab structure uh, might be on the flow. We then had to incorporate a lot of other data in order just to define what is the thermal structure of the subducting part of the plate and then the overriding plate. And that's very important because it ends up actually controlling both your density structure and your rheological structure so it be tied to that thermal structure. Um, and so what we found here was that uh, if you have flow, actually the flow rate and pattern of flow depends on the rheological structure um, that you choose. And we used a suite of observations to try to constrain what uh, was the best rheological structure for um, uh, this region of the mantle. So we used observations of seismic anisotropy shown on the top. The blue um, bars are observations from um, Doug Christensen. And then the uh, yellow and um, uh, red bars are what we predicted from our model. And I know you can't see exactly the comparison here, but we found that um, you, you could get a good agreement uh, uh, in the models if you have a non-Newtonian rheology and you had to have a very sharp edge to the slab. Um, we also compared these models to the observed plate motion, the rate and direction of plate motion that we predicted for the Pacific plate, and then regions of uplift and sub subsidence in the overriding plate that was being driven by this coupling of the St. Jude slab to the overriding plate. And then we also looked at regions of volcanism and compared that to where our models predicted um, decompression melting as the flow comes around the edge of the slab. So then we found that there was good agreement with this little cluster of volcanism um, for the rainbow volcanics, um, which is actually along the edge of the, the eastern edge of the slab. Okay. So a second example um, is of, of looking at the process of ridge trench interaction. And this um, model was motivated by observations off the coast of Baja, California where as the Farallon plate was subducting and breaking into pieces underneath North America, um, we ended up with sort of a stranded fossil ridge um, along the border of Baja, California, shown here by the dashed uh, line. Um, and so what the question we had was actually, well, as you have a ridge approaching a trench, um, what actually controls um, how close um, that ridge can get to the trench whether you actually subduct a ridge. There's been plenty of mo models in the geological literature for subducting ridges. Um, and uh, you know, we thought that this would be related actually to, in some ways, to the strength of the plates and how, as you have younger and younger material entering the, the subduction zone, you have thinner and thinner plates. Um, so we wanted to look at what controls the process of slab detachment and ridge abandonment outside of a subduction zone. And we developed more of a sort of generic model. We didn't try to actually go back and reproduce exactly the geometry off of the coast of Baja, California. Instead, we set up a simple um, a 3D model domain with a narrow um, subducting uh, slab segment. Um, we put a ridge offshore of the trench with two transform boundaries on either side, and then an initial slab that would then drive the system um, dynamically. So there's no imposed kinematic boundary conditions. And then we, we looked at cases where you had just a single ridge, and then also cases where you have um, uh, an offset ridge segment similar to what you see off the coast of Baja, California. And um, we then com compared the results to observations of um, what did we actually see as the plate age at the trench, the point where uh, detachment occurred, um, what was the geometry that was used to actually uh, to create the models, and then looking at the volcanism and deformation of the upper plate um, uh, in Baja, California, and the location of the fossil slab beneath Baja. There's actually nice seismic imaging of a little portion of the Farallon plate that's still stuck underneath Baja, California. So that gives you a, a, a constraint on where detachment actually occurred. So this is um, a 3D uh, movie um, based on this uh, 3D calculation. Uh, the, uh, Numerical resources required to run this one model was about three and a half weeks of time on 360 processors. Um, so this is a very big computationally intensive um, calculation to do this kind of time-dependent model with the, with the resolution that was necessary. Now what you see in this model, it starts with the initial slab, which basically steepens and rolls back a bit. And, um, and then as it, let me pause this, uh, as the ridge gets closer to the trench, you can actually see the ridge, the, 
the ridge in the, in the thermal isosurface back here. This is the section that's closer, and there's another section of ridge over here. As these get closer, you actually end up with sort of a thinning region at the project projection of the transform along the fracture zone um, of that ridge. That be, it ends up being sort of a, the initial um, a weak point in the slab that opens up as a whole. And then what surprised us here was that actually the detachment progresses into the older <coughs> plate first, not the younger plate. Okay, um, and that was uh, interesting to us. And we saw this actually in um, cases where you have a uniform plate age that the detachment starts at the center and progresses outward. And so that the end point, the outer edge of the slab, is actually the last point of connection. And the reason for this is that an older plate um, is actually a little bit colder and will be deforming by plastic yielding, whereas the warmer plate is, um, is actually uh, deforming more physically, is actually able to stretch in response to the changing um, stresses. So uh, this was an un unexpected result. And we found then also sorry, that upwelling of hot mantle through the slab gap um, um, would produce the, the unusual volcanism that was found in, in, in Baja following the cessation of subduction. Um, okay, so then the final example um, is looking at uh, the question of what controls slab flattening and how might this be um, connected to slab parallel flow. And this was motivated by um, observations shown here for um, the Central America in which you plot profiles of the slab dip um, in the more northern region, um, you have shallow slab dips which progress to more normal slab shapes as you go further to the south. And the correlation here is that those, those flat slab uh, regions um, are correlated with the region of low heat flow. Um, and there's sort of a chicken and egg question here is the low heat flow because the slab is flat, um, so you don't have mantle convection there. Um, but if we look at the tectonic history here, the Maya block is actually an older cratonic block in the cortis block. And so you might expect it to actually have started out as a colder region, which then had a feedback and an effect on the subduction process. Um, so what we asked were, can variations in overriding plate thermal structure actually affect slab dip and mantle flow? And we set up, in this case, a pretty generic model um, for looking at the subduction. So we have a 3D model in which we have a subducting plate with two lateral plates on the side. So you have flow around the edges of the plate. And then on the overriding plate, we could start out with either a uniform plate age or have one section which is colder than another section. And then ask how, um, how this lab dip actually evolves in time underneath these two different sort of thermal structures that change um, along strike of the slab. And uh, so the initial, we start out with an initial proto slab, um, which is generated under a plate with a uniform temperature. And then we basically overwrite the temperature on one side of the plate um, in order to make that part cooler and then restart the calculation. So again, it's completely dynamically driven. There's no kinematic boundary condition. And unfortunately, I do not have some very nice 3D visualizations for you on this. I just have to give you a slide. And that's because Mac OSS updated something that <laughs> <laughs> um, our 3D visualization software can, cannot can't make an excellent window anymore. Um, and so they're working on it, um, but I found this out, of course, like Thursday. And <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I just have this one slice to show you from these results. Um, so what you're looking at is um, two slices at 300 kilometers depth. Um, this is viscosity, so the blue thing is basically a slice through that initial slab shape at a time step of zero. At the southern end of the slab, you see the typical sort of toroidal flow with a trench parallel uh, corner flow um, in the center. But as you go to the north where you have, you have this colder section of plate, there's some hint of there being a, a, a trend parallel flow being driven by this uh, variation in the uh, age of the temperature of the overriding plate. As we run this forward in time, you actually see that the, the um, slab dip changes. You can see that this side is actually staying over while this side is actually staying steep. And so what's happening is that one side of the slab is actually shallowing a bit compared to the other side of the slab. And it's basically being, because you have a colder overriding plate, your suction stresses, basically the hydrodynamic stresses on the slab, are a little bit stronger. And it actually helps to actually pull the slab up into that colder plate. And that drives not only 
a flat parallel flow in the mantle wedge portion, but actually drives a very large component of side parallel flow behind the slab. And this is a 2,000 kilometer, kilometer long slab in which you have strong side parallel flow along that entire slab section. And so this, um, this result suggests that observations that we see of slab parallel flow in the mantle, um, both in the mantle wedge and in um, the nascent wedge, especially along very long subduction zones like South America, might be driven by um, transient motion of the slab in response to perhaps the overriding structure of the overriding, of the overriding plate. And, um, and so these are something where you actually have to look at the time evolution of a non-steady state structure of the slab in order to see what's actually driving that flow. Okay, so now I want to come back to the question of what is the limiting, great limiting step in all of these sorts of models um, and what sort of cyber infrastructure do you need for this type of subduction modeling. Um, so all of the examples that I've shown you have three basic things in mind. Um, in common, we need state-of-the-art numerical modeling software um, for these very large 3D models. We need visualization of the data and model results to allow us not just to understand the dynamics of what happens in our models, but then understand whether those are really predicting the observations that we have. Um, and then we need a lot of observations both to create the models and to test the models. And so um, we can sort of break these down into these three different boxes and ask, uh, and what is the cyber infrastructure that we need? And uh, we can, so I've broken this down into sort of the three cases. We need access to and sharing of numerical modeling software. And I think that this is being done um, very well now by um, CIG, which has been developed over the last five years and is now in the second five years of, of, of work. And CIG shares and supports um, existing community developed codes. It helps to develop new cutting edge software and also train the next generation of geodynamicists. And if you would have asked me what the rate limiting step is in, in, in this process a few years ago, I would have said it's the software. We have reached the limit of what we can do with the software that we have available. Um, it doesn't scale to a large enough computers. It doesn't allow us to have adaptive meshes which can shrink down the size of the models that we're running. But those changes are actually happening now in CIG. And so um, I think that we're right on the cusp of software not being the rate limiting step in this process anymore. The next um, important uh, thing that we need access to is visualization tools. And so I just made this sort of 2D plot of different tools that I've used or attempted to use in my own research, going from everything from very generic um, uh, uh, software like GNT, MathWorks, Visitor, PeerView, um, that work on things from maps or 2D all the way over to 3D um, data. And then more specialized applications which have been developed um, within our community, things like GeoMap App or GPlace, and then the tech case group which I'm involved in, which has been developing um, different types of 3D visualization software. My main point that I would make here is that um, we have to, I think we should really continue to encourage science-driven development of visualization analysis tools. Um, when you work, when you have this tight relationship between the main scientists, the computer scientists, you can really um, develop tools that allow you to explore the data that you have, the models that you have in a way that would really expedite that process for, for your own application. Um, so I think continuing to support that uh, um, community-driven development of utilization tools can be an important part of EarthQ. And then the final um, thing that we need is access to and sharing of data. And so I've listed all kinds of data that I need access to sort of divided into sort of 3D volume points and sensor data as well as 2D map line and point data sets. And I think the real challenge for EarthQ is figuring out a way that allows someone like me to get access to all of this data um, in a way that allows me to design models and in a way that allows me to test models. And that means accessing the data in very different ways. Right? Sometimes, in order to test a model, I need to look at profiles or correlations of data. Whereas, in developing the model, I might need to bring volumes of data together and extract surfaces. Okay? And so, um, this I think is right now the rate limiting step in further subduction and discovery. We just, there's so much data out there that we have it in mind that will give us information on how 
conduction is coupling the overriding plate deformation, volcanism, <coughs> vaulting, as well as the actual deformation in the slabs, which you know, there's a huge amount of data in terms of seismicity and moment temperature, which really hasn't been mined completely and even coupled in a way to subduction models. Just really ask, you know, are these moment tensors related to phase transition, uh, metal, metal steel olivine? Is it the torquing of the slab as it goes through the phase transition? Um, what, uh, so there's, there's a wealth of questions that we haven't been able to tackle because we haven't been able <coughs> to easily get to the data. We just spend so much time on the uh, getting, trying to get the data and create and put it into a form that we can use um, that we don't have the time on the back end to just spend on analysis and thinking. Okay. So another aspect of this is what I would say removing the read from research, which is the opposite of what I tell all of my graduate students, which is that's the read in research. That's why you're doing it again. Um, <laughs> Um, and what I mean by this is that uh, every time that we start a project like this, we have to scour the literature for the most recent data. There might be a really good paper that was published you know, five years ago or ten years ago that did a really nice correlation study um, that you could use as a constraint on uh, your dynamic models. For example, people might be familiar with Lalamont's study of the relationship between slab shape and kinematics and what that uh, made you think about in terms of dynamics, okay? And I, it made a data set available that you could play with and think about what the relationships were. Now, now they made certain choices in that um, analysis that now we have different data sets or I might think that there are better choices, but now I have to redo that entire, um, you know, basically downloading of all the research and make, remaking all of the plots. So that was somebody's PhD thesis. And we our number to make progress on, on the understanding of the dynamics is each time we do a dynamical model, we also have to have another PhD thesis of just getting the data. Okay. All right. Um, so um, the last, I think, I think this is the last one. No, two more points. Um, the last two points would be in order to make this infrastructure for helping with data access and sharing, we have to think about how the data is used in model design and analysis. How does it need to be accessed and extracted? Um, and allowing flexibility so that you can get the up-to-date um, data and data options that you need. Um, if each time you go to a study, you might need the same source of data, but you want to use the most up-to-date results that you can. Um, so be flexible, but anticipate how the scientific questions require the data to be presented. And then finally, um, I think that we want access to all of this data. And I'm a data consumer. I don't create data. <laughs> okay. Um, and so we need to make contributing data easy um, in some way. And I think that the success of Earth Cube um, is going to depend on making it the place for data to be accessed. So that whenever anybody starts a project and says, well, I need to get data, the first thing they do is they just click on the Earth Cube site and they know that going there is going to be the place to find all of the data that they need. Um, and that means that you need to have motivation for PIs to contribute the data. Um, they need to know that the data access in that location is, is going to be um, the best place to make their data available and then that will lead to referencing of their own papers, um, you know, some sort of uh, um, carrot um, in that respect. And then finally, um, a big question you have is if you have all these different sorts of data sets, how can you make contributing easy when there are so many different types of data? Um, you know, we have point sets, maps, volume data, uh, vector data, tensor data, all different sorts of data that we want to people to be able to contribute and access. Um, and so I think EarthCube needs to think about being a framework for, create, um, for the community to develop and share the infrastructure for actually how to get the data. So we can't expect or ask EarthCube to actually make the, the, the software or the functions that, it, that actually access the data, but they create the framework for us to develop that, um, that actual interface. Right? So that we are the ones to say, this is how I need to access the data. Just give me, you be the one to figure out how to get the data to me. Okay? Um, um, so because if, you, if, if we let somebody else develop that infrastructure, we're going to end up with an unflexible system or we're going to end up with a system that doesn't actually give us the data that we need. Okay. So uh, I'll just leave with the conclusions there. Um, 
there's a, a lot of very good questions related to modeling subduction dynamics, um, uh, very uh, significant scientific questions related to sort of evolution of our planet. Um, the modeling requires cutting edge software, visualization tools, and lots and lots of data. Uh, and so that it needs to be the focus for Earth Cube. And then finally, acquiring and manipulating data into a useful form can be the rate limiting process. And so grassroots development of visualization and data access <laughs> is what any Earth Cube needs to, to try to, to give us as a community. Thank you.